Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. So today we're going to be going all up over Gregor Mendel and Mendelian genetics and those initial genetic crosses he did. And we're going to use the terminology we built on last chapter to go, not last chapter, last video, to go into more detail today and help us understand what he did. All right, so first here, let's go a little bit about Gregor Mendel. You might have heard about him before. This might be the first time you're hearing about him, but he was an Austrian monk. And today we call him, you know, the father of genetics. So what exactly did he do? Uh, so he did experiments back, when was it, 1856 to 63. So these were pretty long ago. He then published these in 66, so 1866. And then he got busy with his monk stuff and well, I think he started teaching more and things like that. And he didn't do as many experiments, so he didn't do anything after that. And he, But he still published it. And his work was rediscovered in 1900. So this was after he died, so posthumously. And they realized this man found a lot of the modern stuff we understand today about chromosomes using pea plants. So Mendel, this is why he's the father of genetics, you know, he's also one of the uh, original people using the scientific method without having, you know, you know, I mean, he still went to university and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, he's just you know messing with his pea plants, taking notes, just using the scientific method, asking questions, observing, and making hypotheses. So, you know, really cool to see, you know, how that worked back then. So let's go over what he did. So what he did was he took, you know, pea plants. That's what he's notorious for. He performed controlled crosses of pea plants and documented phenotypes of offspring for seven characters. Remember what a character is. Uh, so a character here, uh, looking at seed shape, um, kind of lead on color, uh, flower color, uh, pod form, pod color, stem place, or stem size. So all of these are found in two discrete versions. And this is really important. So remember, two versions. So it's not round, wrinkled, and somewhere in between. It's not purple, white, and red. It's two versions. So two traits, one character. And that becomes actually very important when we start, start talking about chromosomes and linked genes coming up later, and also non-Mendelian genetics, so incomplete dominance, co-dominance, and things like that. So he got very lucky with what he studied, and we'll learn about how he got lucky later on in the semester. Uh, but so two discrete versions, and these are a sort of different things, and this is why we always talk about you know round versus wrinkled peas here, because those are you know the easiest ones to talk about. So what did he do first? First, he did something called a monohybrid cross. So this is when you cross a single character. So what he did was he took, let's say, you know, yellow versus green seeds right here. So he took yellow versus green seeds. And pretend you don't see, let me erase all these letters inside here because we don't really know these letters. Uh, he, well, pretend he didn't know these letters back then. So he took two true breeding parents. So a true breeder is when you cross, so yellow with yellow with itself makes yellow, green uh, with green makes green. So remember, this is the parent generation here. So then he crossed two true breeders together for two different forms of that character. So here crossing yellow and green. So if you crossed yellow and green here, you know, what would you expect? You don't know. You, you Imagine, go into this thinking you have no idea what the results are going to be. So in this situation, all were yellow. So here, all yellow, which was interesting. What happened to the green? Why did the green disappear? So at this point, you know, he called yellow the dominant trait. Because it dominated over the green. He didn't know what happened to the green. He thought the green kind of disappeared here. So then what he did, so this was the F1 or first filial. And what he did then, he took an F1, cross an F1 for the next generation, to make the F2 generation. Now in the F2 generation, so this is crossing a yellow with a yellow. And then when you think about that, you should get yellow. But in this case, the green reappeared. So you got three yellow and one green. That's a ratio. So this is called a three to one 
ratio. This is a very common ratio we see in genetics. So a three to one ratio with one green. Now, why did that green come back? He called this green trait recessive. And that it hid with this yellow trait. And he did this, he did these crosses many times for all of these different characters here, and he kept getting this three to one ratio. You could go find tables that show all you know his numbers and things like that, but he kept getting this three to one. So let's just focus on geno, uh, uh, phenotypes, yellow to green, three to one. He didn't really know the genotypes yet, uh, but he, did, he ended up making the letters for figuring it out. So what did he conclude from these monohybrid cl uh, crosses? So these are kind of his little rules here. So uh, one, uh, two, and three three for the monohybrid. So first one was each character is encoded by two genetic factors. So he called these genetic factors. We now call these alleles, so two per individual. Uh, so two genetic factors, alleles. We Now we know they're on, alleles are located on chromosomes like that. He didn't, we didn't know chromosomes existed back then. The second one here is the law of segregation. So this is Mendel's first law as well. So what does this law mean? He actually <laughs> defined meiosis in doing this. So alleles are separated when gametes form. So when gametes form, remember, alleles go to opposite cells during anaphase. But we didn't know anaphase was going on then. And then alleles segregate into gametes with equal probability. We talked about the probability stuff last chapter, you know, this one could go left, this one could go right, or this one could go left and that one could go right. There's no saying what goes left and right. It's all about random assortment. And then the other thing he came up from the monohybrid was the concept of dominance, which I talked about later, uh, but just to refresh here, so some alleles are dominant and always express, and the others are recessive, and they're masked by the dominant alleles in heterozygous individuals. So you don't know they're there. And he discovered that, which is kind of cool. You know, you think about it today. Nothing about enzymes and things like that. He's just making the initial observations from all of this. So this is what he got from just these little monohybrid crosshairs, doing them over and over again and getting similar results. Uh, so coming up, we're going to be doing, you know, our own Punnett square. So this is called a Punnett square right here. And we're going to be doing our own Punnett squares. And I have a whole other video going over how to set them up. And then I'll even uh, record another example problem video after this chapter too, so that we can really work on making these Punnett squares. So this would be a monohybrid cross. And now we're going to go into a dihybrid cross. So a dihybrid cross is two characters. So Mendel decided to take this one step further and follow two characters. So round and wrinkled, yellow and green. So, you know, something like this. Remember, this is how you'd write this cross with two traits or two characters in there. So what he did was two true breeders again. Here we have the true breeders returning for the parent generation. So again, a yellow round with a yellow round makes more yellow rounds, always. A yellow wrinkled with yellow wrinkled always makes yellow wrinkled. He didn't know that that meant he was finding both as homozygous dominant, but that's what we know today. And then, so he crossed a yellow round with a yellow wrinkled, and he got all yellow round. So let's just focus on phenotype over here. So if you get all yellow round, I mean, he did these ones already and said, okay, so maybe that recessive trait is hiding in there. So then he did, of course, the F1 cross the F1 again to produce the F2 generation. When he produced the F2 generation, these were the phenotypes. Nine yellow rounds, okay, that makes sense. But then green round. Whoa, that wasn't even a parent. So you look up here, the parent, you have green wrinkle, but now we have green round. That was a big discovery for him. We also have a wrinkled yellow, also not a parent. So both these are not like the parents and are a new combination. And then of course we have one green wrinkled. So this is a nine, three, three, 
one ratio. So if you ever have a heterozygous dihybrid cross, so you know heterozygous, both traits, or both characters are heterozygous, dihybrid cross, you will always get a 9331 ratio if it's Mendelian genetics. Again, we'll talk about non-Mendelian genetics later in the semester. But this was really amazing. And again, we'll go over how to set up uh, this cross here in the next video. Uh, so don't worry about that yet. We're focused on the phenotype over there. This was a, just a good image for me to use the phenotype information. So again, here, we're focused on, you know, this 933 run ratio and imagining being Mendel in this situation. So, if, you know, he did that for all of these again and kept getting that 9331 ratio. So it was super, super cool that he discovered this back then. And so what did he conclude from this? Change color here. So conclusions from the dihybrid cross he, he created, his second law. And this is the law of independent assortment. So this law actually, you know, that's, he got that from these points right here. The fact that we have a green round and a yellow wrinkled, which aren't like the parents, told him these characters separate independently from each other along with the alleles separating independently from each other. And that's what this says here. So the alleles for a character segregate into gametes independently of alleles for a different character. So he got really lucky here that these genes were located on different chromosomes. Let's say this was one, and then here is another chromosome with the other gene. So with the other uh, character. He got lucky that they weren't linked and the Bs weren't here. If it was like that, his results wouldn't, been, wouldn't have been as clear because then more, a higher chance of them sorting together rather than independently from each other. And we'll be talking about that next chapter when we start going into linked genes. And that's what I mean by a linked gene is when those two genes are on the same chromosome. So here he got lucky where they're on separate sets. Uh, so that's what Mendel did. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of work, a lot of great work. And again, his stuff wasn't rediscovered until after he passed away, and, but he still provided a lot of great information. And not only that, you could relate all his work back to what we now know of meiosis. So here, uh, our good friend Sutton, no, not my good friend, but, you know, back in the day, Sutton came out and then was one of the ones who, you know, was the original describers of the chromosomal basis of inheritance. And then now we can relate chromosomes to Mendel's law. So here's Sutton came up with the chromosomal basis of inheritance to relate to Mendel's laws. And he made the statement that it is due to homologue separation in meiosis. So now we have a better understanding of meiosis. We have a better understanding of chromosomes and that Mendel's discoveries were due to homologue separation. Remember, this, so I'm using this image from a previous video here, homologue separation. So here you have, you know, chromosome duplication, the Homologue pairs now line up, crossing over could then occur between each homologous pair here. And then they then sort independently of each other in anaphase one. So here, you know, one goes one way, one goes the other way. They then separate and go through meiosis two where sister chromatids then separate. So Mendel actually discovered this process. So again, due to homologue separation and meiosis is how these units separate from each other. And I could go through and draw out the uh, letters here showing how the separation uh, could occur, but I don't think I'll do that here. But then you just know that you can get all these different gametes that form. And these gametes that form is then how we go and write, you know, the crosses we have for making a Punnett square. So let's say within these chromosome arrangements here, this was, you know, these are our genes. Uh, so here, you know, if I were to draw them, in here, I guess I will a little bit. So let's say there's one A, there's the other A, and then there's a B, and then there's a recessive B. If we were to go through all of this and map it out, we'd have a couple different allele combinations that occur. So you could have a, you know, the dominant form once they, you know, separate. Now, ignore the crossing over event here. We're not focused on that right now. So this one would be this 
combination. And I drew, drew the B up there. And then we could have this combination. So this is called, you, if you've heard of it in math, FOIL, first, outside, inside, last. You could do the same thing for writing gametes. So first, and then you could do outsides. So big A, little b. So here you'd have A, then down here, uh, little b. And then insides, little a, big b. So now on this one, you'd have, you know, little a right there. And then again here, you'd have, uh, well, this one would technically be, um, oh no, big b right there. Again, ignore the uh, whole crossing over part. Um, oh wait, I think I, I drew this one wrong. This one would technically be little b. <laughs> and then, uh, oh yeah, because it's crossing over, ignore the crossing over event. Ignore it, ignore it. Uh, let's stick with this. Uh, and then the last one here is last. So little a, little b. So yeah, this shows us the possible gamete separations here. And then this is what you would use to write, you know, the gametes for the cross. So if you were doing this, you know, cross another heterozygous individual here, when you form that Punnett square, these would be the top axis. So if you look up here, so you got to write, you know, the gametes from the heterozygous, one heterozygous parent and then the other heterozygous parent. That's where we get these lines right here. You want one across the top, one down the sides, and then you fill it in like a multiplication table. Remember, and you want to keep the gametes together. So big Y, big Y, big R, big R. Then over here, if there's a dominant one at first, let's say we're reading it this direction, um, don't, or this over here, don't write the little Y first. Write the dominant one first. It makes it easier to read. And again, don't write this as this form either that's you don't want to write it like that so don't keep these together and these together put the chromosomes back together here uh, to make it easier to read when you are figuring out the phenotypes or the genotypes in the following problem all right that's all i have for today i know i didn't go into too much detail about setting this up and working through problems that's because next video we'll go over that so if you have questions feel free to reach out and let me know again that's all i have for today and i hope you all have a wonderful day and bye bye